Great. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, here we are again, uh, and this time it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Andy Grierson. Now, Andy is a senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield with a BSc in genetics and a PhD in molecular biology. In 2008, he became interested in Y chromosome genetics uh, through studies of his own paternal ancestry. And since 2009, He's been researching the population genetics of North Wales, and in 2011, made contact with a group of non-academic citizen scientists um, who posted their research on a now defunct website called DNA Forums. And this has subsequently led to a very fruitful collaboration. Um, so Andy, in this presentation, will describe the journey that we have taken to identify Y chromosome variants in Western Europeans. And he'll be talking about the 1000 Genomes Project, uh, which is a groundbreaking genetics program, and was the first to make anonymized human genome data openly available on a large scale. So by accessing this resource and implementing open source computational approaches, we have identified hundreds of new genetic markers relevant to the ancestry of more than 100 million European men. So, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to give a warm welcome to Andy Grierson. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Because I can't hear me. Okay. So, um, as uh, Morris just said, um, I'm at the University of Sheffield. I'm normally in a neuroscience department working on diseases of the nervous system. Uh, this uh, sort of sideline in genetics, population genetics, um, has kind of taken off in the last few years as something that I've been doing. Uh, kind of in the evenings, maybe. Um, so I'm sort of, as Morris said, I sort of became interested by doing my own family tree, and then um, I was trying to find the first test that I'd done. Um, and actually, I'd completely forgotten that I tested with Ancestry, uh, at whatever it was, 25 markers or something, and then that immediately showed that I had a very high chance of being in this M222 so-called sort of Irish cluster, which was news to me. Uh, and I suppose that then became the kind of hook that got me interested, and it now seems to make some sense. And, and, and there's a number of us with the same surname who all have this, uh, we're all members of this branch, who all come from the same part of South West Scotland. So that was kind of what got me into it. Um, so this website here, uh, DNA Forums, was where I would be kind of in the background almost all the time. Um, but unfortunately this website doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it just sort of disappeared, literally, and is no longer <laughs> to be found. Uh, which was rather sad, but I guess that's the way of... Um, you know, we're used to people disappearing without trace in genealogy, and this website has done exactly that. Um, but there's many more websites, and I'll come on to them at the end. So what happened was that on this website, a guy called Greg uh, started posting some interesting ideas about how you could use thousand genomes data. And he posted a few messages, and then I just thought I'd get in touch with him and ask him about what he was doing. And I said, look, I'm a biologist, but I've got no idea about how to work with any of this stuff. Could you, you know, help me to understand it? And then straight away he came in with a highly technical email, which I didn't understand really. Uh, <laughs> But it, it showed that he was keen to sort of engage and, and also um, to, to try and sort of work together with people that might know about sort of the other side of the coin, I guess. Um, now, at this point, uh, Greg was writing up a PhD, but not in biology, in some sort of uh, engineering discipline that I'm not entirely sure of. Um, so, what happened? Um, what happened then was that we started exchanging regular messages on this site. Uh, with lists of uh, markers that we thought were uh, were likely to be uh, SNPs that were shared by a couple of people. So my interest straight away was this um, grouping that we've heard a bit about this morning, defined by this SNP called L21. Um, and that's basically what uh, about a quarter of the people in England, or men in England, are carrying probably half of the men in Wales, probably three quarters of the men in Ireland. So it's, it's very prevalent on the kind of Atlantic coastline of, of the British Isles. Um, but at that point, not much was known about what happened below this marker. 
Um, so we were looking, or I was particularly interested in looking at, at this branch to try and find new variants. Um, so essentially what the method that we used was not really rocket science. Um, there were ways of finding uh, the people who were in the right HAPA group amongst the Thousand Genomes Project. So the Thousand Genomes Project was actually the sequencing of more than a thousand genomes, uh, more, like, um, more like sort of three or four thousand genomes, collected from anonymous individuals around the world, um, a, a, a core sample that were formed phase one of the project came from Northern Europe, um, and then subsequently phases two and three took in uh, much more diverse populations around the world. Um, so luckily the European sample was one of the first to be done. Um, and this is an example of one of these big data projects where the people who are running the project, and in this case we're talking about a grouping of labs in the UK, Europe, North America, um, they would upload the sequence data and make it freely available to anybody who actually knew how to get hold of it um, before they published on it themselves. So this is kind of... Um, one way of operating, it's a very open way of operating, and it's, it's very good for people in our community if we're interested at all in trying to do something uh, for ourselves. So, the files are there on an FTP server, I had no idea how to get them, but Greg knew how to get to, uh, to the files, um, and was able to basically identify, first of all, people who were in the right branch of the, the males, in the right branch of the white chromosome tree uh, that we were all interested in, um, and then we would simply look for variants that occurred more than once in the collection. And that would indicate either this thing was some sort of um, artifact, or it was a polymorphism that two men shared, and that would be likely to delineate a new branch in the Y chromosome tree. So it was, it was pretty simple. Um, and I only found this yesterday, actually, when I was reviewing some old files, and I'd forgotten that we actually used to do it like this. So we used to do these really terrible-looking uh, diagrams, and these are the people uh, here. Some of these names might be familiar to you. Um, so these are the, the code numbers of the samples. And these uh, here are positions on the Y chromosome, and these two guys here all carry polymorphisms here, and this one's also got this one here. So. Um, the, um, this marker here was the first one that we actually kind of worked out for ourselves um, and uh, it later went on to become known as the DF1, it's also called L513. Um, so the, um, the DF naming, uh, the DF naming came, comes from the DNA forum, we just thought that would be a nice way of naming the markers because that's where we kind of were operating. So this was when um, uh, this was me sending an impatient email to the guys in the sequencing facility in Sheffield saying, I don't want to hassle you, but I really want to know what the results are here. Um, he said, oh, it's good news. Uh, the results are ready. Um, and then this was basically when we found this C here. So these two people carry C. This person carries T. So this was basically the first variant that we found for ourselves, starting with the data downloading from the Saga. Not the sort of analyzing it, designing primers, sort of finding it again in an independent sample. So that kind of proved to us that we could actually do this without anybody um, other than ourselves, um, and that we could maybe um, start to, to do this kind of in a routine way. So over the next few months, um, so we sort of started almost straight away in February 2011. Uh, by July, we have got down to DF25. Um, there's a, a lag time in all of this in that we would find these things, characterize them, but then actually to get them commercially available, that's nothing to do with me, so we would simply write to the companies that provide these sorts of tests and say, you might want to offer this test, so that they have to develop it and see whether it's working in their hands, and then eventually it goes on sale, and then finally it takes them several months to return the results. So finally you start to get people turning up positive, and actually the funny thing about DF1 was that it turned out to actually define a branch of the Y chromosome that had already been found using these STR markers, so it was a good match, and, and that group were pretty happy about, about that. Um, and actually the next one that we found, the F5, it, it, actually the first person to test positive for it was one of the people who'd actually joined in our little group, this guy called Dave Reynolds, 
Um, so um, it sort of showed that what we were doing was, was interesting and relevant to the field. Um, so we didn't just work on R1, um, on L21. We also started looking at other branches like 312. And, and Greg was most interested in, uh, in, in U106 because that's the branch that he's in. So, um, so then it started to become clear that other people were interested in doing this sort of thing. So people started posting on the DNA forums that they were doing. Uh, they were identifying other variants, and that's how we came across uh, this guy called uh, Rich Rocker, who's in New Jersey, uh, and is some sort of computer director of a, of a company in the States. Again, not, not a biologist, but interested in uh, genetic genealogy. He's particularly interested in P312 and U512, and he is um, he had started looking in a similar way for SNPs in those branches. Uh, so we uh, got in touch with him and started to do the same sort of thing. And, and basically, a number of other people started joining in. So we had a whole group of people that were all uh, sharing information, resources, picking emails and messages around about new markers and new positions. Um, I was sort of then taking these markers and seeing if we could turn them into tests, seeing if we could actually independently validate them outside of these um, resources that existed in the Thousand Genomes Project. Um, and then we were releasing them, and at that point, we were sort of doing it anonymously so that we didn't create any sort of uh, excess uh, email traffic um, in my direction, basically. Um, and then Thomas Crane, who was at that point in Family Tree DNA, was involved in developing these and making them available for the most part, although we ended up communicating with, with other companies as well so that we were being kind of fair and equitable. So using this approach, by, by the end of that year, we'd identified more than 100 novel SNPs. They had names. Greg had started calling his the Z markers because uh, no, one had, no one else had claimed Z and it just seemed a logical one for him to choose. Um, I think there's, there's tens of thousands of Z markers now. <laughs> Um, I stuck to DF, and the DF ones are the ones that have kind of been um, validated internally. Some of the Z ones have also been um, validated by me. Uh, there was lots of interest on the forums. Uh, we found SNPs in other haplogroups, like haplogroup I. Um, and then, uh, actually, both Rich and I, at that point, sort of started muttering about maybe we should write this up because it's an interesting way of doing things. I think Greg at that point was quite busy with his PhD, so he was less keen on, on taking the lead on that. Um, but between us, and everybody contributed to the writing of this paper, so we put it onto Google Documents. We all had editorial control over it, and everyone kind of changed the text. It's quite an unconventional way of doing it, in my experience, but it worked. Um, and we managed to publish it. It took a long time, which um, People who do this as a hobby sort of think it's a pain having to wait for their test results to come back before they know what they can do next. But it's a similar frustration waiting for reviewers and editors and then finally the journal to get around to publishing. So it takes absolutely ages, which is why actually uh, the kind of genetic genealogy community moves relatively fast in relation to the academic community. I'll come back to that. Okay, so, um, so what next? What did we do next? Um, so, around that time, the next two phases of the Thousand Genomes Project came out. So, from my perspective, looking at L21, that wasn't uh, going to be particularly promising because uh, the, the samples were taken from much more distant parts of the world. But there were many Iberian, Italian, and Central American samples becoming available. Um, which was relevant to Rich Rocker's interest in P312. Um, so there was some interesting new work to do there on the same lines as we've been doing. And back in July 2011, actually, I, I think I first broached the subject in UK 10K, which was something that I'd, I'd come across at work, which is, well, you can kind of work it out from the name. It's sequencing 10,000 genomes from UK people. And it was a research project uh, supported by the Wellcome Trust. Uh, and again, we had to take, this time we had to actually write a kind of research proposal as to why we should get access to this. And I must admit, I was 
somewhat surprised when they did give us access to this because I thought that they would say, well, I know this is really the spirit of this project, but we've got access to the Y chromosome from the UK 10K, and I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. Um, so, one thing that had been appealing to me, and I suspect also to Greg, was that it was taking us actually quite a lot of time to do all of this, and things were scaling up and scaling up, and we thought, well, we all, I felt that there would be better ways of doing it. Um, and I knew that there were packages out there that, that, that evolutionary biologists used to, to generate phylogenies automatically. So we started talking amongst ourselves about whether these things could be tailored to work for Y chromosome data of the sort that was openly available. Um, and then Greg started emailing the people who'd written this software and discussing with the various ways of implementing it. Um, and, and came up with, well, over time, came up and developed a method for basically automating the approach. And likewise, I was getting fed up with um, designing lots of primers, um, because when you're confronted with a list of, say, 20 poly uh, variant sites that define a branch, you can't instantly say, oh, that third one there is going to be the one to go for. You actually have to kind of go through them sequentially and then find out, actually, it's number 19, which is the best one, by which time you've already looked at 18 that are no good. So, um, uh, Basically, we, we, we wanted to know whether there was a way of actually just taking that list of 20, finding the one that you actually want to go for straight away. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. That doesn't mean to say those aren't interesting markers in terms of studying family history. It's just if you actually want to confirm that the thing is a real branch, then the first thing you need to do is actually try and find some people who carry that polymorphism. So this is the approach that Greg came up with for generating phylogenies, as he says, from scratch. The example he's giving here is um, from the 1292 BAM files representing the Thousand Genomes Project Y chromosomes. Um, so he uh, basically downloads the Y chromosomes of all of those samples um, and, and generates um, a very core cool file. So you go from about 300 gigabytes of data down to about 8 gigabytes of data. But within that 8 gigabytes of data, there's about half a million genetic variants uh, and over 500 billion cores for those variants. So there's a huge amount of data. Um, so that step is, is reasonably quick. It takes about a week to generate that variant core file. Um, and um, but this isn't done kind of on your home PC. So we're actually using um, the cluster of computers at the university to give us the sort of power that we need to do this. Um, so then the next step is to actually go through this very important file and try and chuck out all the junk because it's going to be full of lots of variants that probably aren't as formative to us and at the same time convert them into a file format that the Philip uh, phylogenetic tree software can handle. Uh, so that takes some time. So then eventually uh, he's in a position to run Philip analysis um, and this is what takes um, quite a long time. And so at this point, you're looking at a two or three week computer uh, processing time to go from this big Philip file down to 10 megabytes of hopefully real uh, polymorphic sites confirmed in more than one person, which don't look like they're junk and could potentially be useful. And if you don't just get the list, you get it in the format of an actual phylogenetic tree. Um, and so considerable advance, even though it takes a long time, it's a considerable advance on how we were doing it originally, which was basically kind of using logic to reduce the order of things. This gives you the most likely uh, fit straight away. There will be some things that are slightly in the wrong place because there's a bit of data missing, but it gives you a, a considerable advantage about homing in on things that are, are likely to be real new polymorphism. So to cut it short, we, um, we wrote this up um, as, a, as a methods paper um, about basically making a new Y chromosome tree, just starting with the uh, next generation sequencing data. Um, and this essentially was uh, led by Greg and a bunch of other people, including myself, kind of got involved in bits of the analysis and bits of the interpretation. So this has been um, put on this BioArchive X website, which is like one of these pre-publication servers, so it's got a formal publication 
the peer review sense, but it's available for you to look at. You can go on there and download it and have a look at exactly what's involved. Um, so we did actually want to try and um, publish this, but it seems that we've actually gone um, a bit faster than the Thousand Genomes Project in getting to this stage. Now, we don't know what they're doing, but they're presumably trying to publish something similar, possibly in a lot more detail than what we've done. Um, but um, at, at this point in time, the, uh, the, the, something called the Fort Lauderdale Principle. So Fort Lauderdale is a place in Florida where they had a meeting. And it was a meeting where lots of, um, sort of big data scientists met, had a discussion about if they were to do these big data projects and release the data, then they wanted to have some rights to publish first on the data. So the idea is it's a kind of gentleman's agreement that you don't uh, basically gazump somebody uh, in terms of their paper. Um, so we did take steps to uh, try and address this publication, but we didn't receive any reply. Uh, but now we're uh, being asked to observe this uh, principle. Uh, well, we're not quite sure what's going to happen next. Anyway, never mind that. Um, we are, um, some of the things that we found in this process were to do with, um, well, that interested me, it weren't really the whole kind of history of the world side of it, but is there anything that we can infer from the tree that might give us a handle on some events that we don't really understand? So one thing that had been um, appealing to me for some time was the fact that in some regions of the R1B tree, there were many parallel branches, whereas in other regions, there was a kind of stepwise bifurcating tree structure. And in, in the field of kind of phylogenetic and evolutionary genetics, it's thought that they call these things where you have many parallel branches um, a star like phylogeny. So that means multiple lines of descent are surviving in each generation. So lots and lots of offspring are surviving and producing their own offspring and their own offspring. So you end up with many, many new polymorphisms all coming from a single branch. Um, so we were wondering. If we look globally at our analysis of the thousand genomes data, where did we find this? Um, so if you, pop, if you plot out the number of sub-branches that you have for every kind of parent branch, you find the overwhelming majority is a bifurcation. So there's only two branches, um, hundreds. Whereas um, at about 150, there are three branches. Then you start to get down to four, five, and six, and you're down into sort of tens. And then there are these extreme outliers over here with huge numbers of surviving branches. Now, I'm slightly concerned that this could be a kind of bias in the sampling. If we're actually under sampling a population, we might see this. Um, but, you know, it's a global analysis. It's the biggest data set we've got. So we, we decided to have a look at it in more detail. So when you start to look at where these, um, the biggest one is, this one, DF27, which is a marker that Rich Rocker first identified in um, P312, and it's probably a, it looks like it's going to be the biggest branch of P312 in, in Spain. Uh, that's got 18 parallel sub branches, so it looks like it's given rise to a huge population expansion. Um, and there's another one here, DF13, so I'll come to this in a minute. This is the one that's most common in, in Western Britain. And then L2 down the bottom there is part of U152, um, and that's probably in Central Europe or Italy, somewhere like that. Now the other place that you're finding it is all in upper group E. And this is all in Central Africa. Um, and this kind of is most consistent with something called the Bantu population expansion, which is known to have come from that part of Africa. Now, I'm not going to even attempt to get involved with dating any of this, because I don't think anybody's really got a clue yet about how to date these things properly. Um, obviously, we've heard a whole couple of stories there about the, the European population. So all of these were um, on the slides that, that Mike Hammer showed about various parts of Europe. So um, I'm actually using the same figures as him from this Busby paper. Uh, so this is the frequency of L21. So DF13 is almost 99% of L21 will be DF13. Um, so that's basically where they are. L2 is over here somewhere, DF27 is over here somewhere, and it will look kind of similar. There'll be a big high frequency of DF27 here, there'll be a high frequency of L2 here. So something's happened. Um, 
at some point, uh, it may be farming, it may not be farming, it may be metal work, it may not be metal work, uh, to lead to these populations expansion. But we're finding evidence for them in the phylogeny scale. So I just put this in because, uh, as a scientist, I don't know whether you how familiar you are with this, um, we're asked to, uh, that our research has to have impact. Uh, we can't do anything unless it's got some sort of impact. And quite often what we do has got no impact really because we work on something that's very specialized. Nobody else really knows about it. It's incredibly complicated to explain. And one of the reasons I quite like working in, in this field of genetics is that people are genuinely engaged with it much more than they would be if I was discussing the genetics of some rare disease, which sounds rather unpleasant and the conversation soon kind of runs out. Um, so our paper that we published in PLOS One, because PLOS One tracks things, it tells you that over 14,000 people have looked at it, so that's quite impactful. And, and what was more surprising to me when I looked it up is the one that only came out in November last year and is slightly contentious. Over a thousand people have looked at it already. So, um, so we have some sort of impact. I don't know whether they're all just looking at it to kind of moan or, or what, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so the next real sort of meaty part of the project that we've got involved in is this UK 10K population cohort. So the idea with UK 10K was to sequence 10,000 genomes. Now again, it's not exactly 10,000 genomes. Um, it's actually 4,000 full genomes and lots and lots of exomes. So we were interested only in the full genome data. So the exome is the coding part of your genome. And as you know, the Y chromosome doesn't really do anything. Uh, apart from making your man. Um, so there's not many e there's not many exons on the Y chromosome, so exome data isn't particularly useful. So whole genome data was all we were interested in. And there were two different whole genome data sets in the UK 10K project. Something called the UK twins, which we thought was pretty cool because twins would have interesting Y chromosomes, because right, they'd have maps, some of them would be identical twins, some of them wouldn't be. Uh, and then this thing called the owls pack study. Now the first bit of bad news was that actually for some reason, due to the history of the project, the UK Twins project was 100% female twins. So that was absolutely no use to us at all. <laughs> so um, luckily the owls pack project didn't show such blank sexism. Uh, and uh, was actually, uh, interestingly for me, uh, sampling around Bristol. So they've been doing lots and lots of studies at the, at the University of Bristol uh, for many, many years uh, and, and studying uh, longitudinal studies basically of health, well-being, you name it, lots of things. Um, and interesting for me, if I'd been born here, they might have had me because I was born there in Kenshin. Um, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, so they sampled 2,000 children born in the 90s across this sort of area. Uh, and their DNA has been sequenced uh, for the benefit of, essentially for the benefit of finding rare genetic variants. So there's this notion that when you're sequencing people looking for disease genes, it's hard to tell the disease gene mutations apart from the background noise. And unless you do a lot of sequencing of people who are control individuals, you won't know that. So it's actually very useful to have a lot of control data. Um, so this raised some problems because this was a huge data set, uh, about a thousand people, uh, and quite frankly I didn't have any money to do this sort of stuff. So we started a, 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 a just giving site where people could uh, make a contribution. Um, I'm pleased to say that, uh, that many people in the community made contributions and we, we raised uh, well, three, three, over three thousand pounds, that's part of five thousand dollars. And that's gone a long way to, to helping us uh, work with this set of samples. So, the slight downside to it is that we're still waiting. So this UK 10K project is actually ended now. Uh, where two thirds of the data still hasn't been uploaded onto their website. The best spirit of these sorts of things. Uh, and it's expected soon, although it's been expected soon for about a year. Uh, although I'm now actually directly in contact with the person who is responsible for uploading the data to the next stage in its journey. Um, and he told me he was going to do it, and he's definitely going to do it now. Um, so, we have had the first third of the data for, for over a year now. Uh, 
uh, based on about 300 new bale samples. They've all come from near Bristol, so if you think about those slides of frequency, they're going to be very useful for studying R1B, um, because that's kind of 60 to 70 percent of men born near Bristol, you would anticipate, would be in the R1B habitat. Um, so we thought that would be very useful, and for me, I thought it would be very useful for uh, these haplogroups that we know are prevalent on the western side of, of Britain. Let's check out, I forgot to tell you. So, um, ah, yeah, no, I was going to tell you about the automation of primer design. So, this is again a bit technical, but what we wanted, what you end up with is a big list of variants that you want to find the one that you can develop as a polymorphic marker, which you can then either make freely available to the public or you can use it for your research. And so basically we, um, we've set up a little scripting, I say we, Greg, set up a little scripting um, approach that takes the list of uh, variant sequences, runs something called Primer Blast on it, which is Blast is a kind of comparison of DNA sequences. So we use that to screen out uh, regions of the Y chromosome which might not actually be unique because they cause problems. Uh, but it also finds PCR primers for us. And then we also look for um, the variants um, that change the DNA in a way which means that we can, I, we can investigate whether or not someone's got a SNP without having to do sequencing. The sequencing is relatively expensive. You can buy these things called restriction enzymes that will cut DNA if there's a certain sequence, or they won't cut the DNA if there's a polymorphism. That's actually a much more cost-effective way of screening lots of samples. If you read in the fine details of some of the papers that we discussed this morning, you'll see that they do this as well, because it's economical. Uh, so then, it's, a, it's basically a way of speeding up the workflow uh, at my end of things. So, uh, what have we got from this? Well, um, the L21 tree, based on the new data that we've got, um, we're looking at now a situation where there's probably at least 28 parallel branches. So it's a bit hard to actually nail down exactly what the established branches of L21 are because some of the uh, some of the L SNPs especially are found in one or two people who may or may not be very closely related. Five minutes left. So um, we've added to that at least six that are confirmed and another 11 that are unconfirmed but they're already found in two people. So there could well be a massive number of parallel branches right below this one marker uh, DF13 here, so indicating that this is really the time at which things took off in this Western British population. So why am I interested in this? Um, well, I became interested in this whole area, aside from my own, my own history, from um, a paper that had been published, which was about Anglo-Saxon migrations from, uh, east, uh, from Central and Northeastern Europe across the British Isles. Um, and in that paper, they'd identified a lot of people with a very unusual capital group for the region. Um, so basically, they'd identified something like 30 to 40 percent of men in North Wales of this capital group E uh, chromosome, mostly found in the Mediterranean. So that's a completely different story. But in the process of investigating these people, I found a hell of a lot of people who were in capital group RL21, um, and I became interested in the idea that these were maybe different from people in England because it was a more rural population, it was separated by a cultural, linguistic and at some point physical barrier from the people in England. And they had this huge L21 frequency. Um, and as was said earlier, there was this idea that these people might somehow be related to the kind of either the farming or the metal work, both of which uh, came to came to Wales. So how do we work on this when well, we do a lot of DNA collection uh, involves going around the place, talking to people, uh, collecting DNA samples, including the music we a rugby match in Wales. Um, and um, what have we got from it? Well, a lot of things, but I was just going to show you this, which is something that's quite striking to me. So this is uh, looking at the old counties of Wales, uh, there's the border with England. And it's looking at the number of people who are positive for L21 and the number of people who are positive for U106. So this is the one that is described as having an origin in Friesland or in Northern Europe. And this is the one that's more common, or most common in Ireland. And what you can see is that across North Wales, 50% of men are in this group, and actually normally less than 10% of men are 
in this group. Um, if you look just across the border in England, um, so actually the sampling we did here was 25 kilometers apart, essentially. And you've got half as many men um, by frequency in L21, and, and more than double in U106. So however this has happened, it looks like the border somehow has kind of exacerbated this and kept these populations apart, and possibly led to a, a kind of an expansion here of L21, or possibly an incursion here of, of, of non l 21 so what we're doing now is testing all of these um, Welsh samples for the new SNPs that we're finding. Um, and the general picture that's emerging at the moment is a low frequency of, of, of lots of different SNPs below L21, with some evidence of little clusters here and there. But we haven't found a kind of a, a, a SNP that looks like it's definitely defining the Welsh yet. It looks like this stuff is just going to be smeared across the whole of uh, the rest of British Isles. Okay, so um, what are we doing now? Um, well, we've still got the rest of the UK 10K data, which is coming soon, as I already said. And also coming soon uh, is this thing called the public data tsunami that everyone keeps going on about. Um, we've already got a kind of couple of reasonable sized waves, I guess, in the form of the Personal Genome Project, which seems to be expanding. And a lot of people on the Personal Genome Project are making their data available. Uh, this company called, um, I forgot what they're called, they're called FGC, uh, and they offer uh, whole white chromosome sequencing. Um, and uh, lots of people who do that, again, are making their data available. Um, and obviously, the thing that's closest to here physically right now is the fact that the company just over there are offering uh, something called the Big Y, which sounds good. Um, which is another kind of way of testing lots of markers on your Y chromosome. So if all of this data gets released, then there certainly will be a tsunami. And I'm not sure what we're going to do uh, in the face of it. Um, but it should mean that there'll be lots more SNPs uh, for, for some time to come. So I just thought I'd end with a slide that talks about all the different places where you can go if you like talking about this sort of stuff, or if you, you probably already know half of these sites. If you like the more technical side of it as well, there are some incredibly sort of techy type conversations on these sites if you want to indulge in those. But there'll also be people on there um, who um, will answer questions that you may not be able to find the answer for anywhere else and will help you and tell you how they did things and so on. So there's loads of these sites uh, out there. Um, so, okay, so then who did the work? So it's, um, it's essentially a laboratory without walls, which is uh, a phrase I stole from Jim Wilson, and I think it's actually quite a good one. Um, in the, if we were working as a lab in competition with other labs, then we wouldn't be doing this sort of thing. We'd be within our walls, and we'd be working hard, but we wouldn't be going out and sticking everything online. But actually, the fact that we are going out and sticking everything online kind of does give us a bit of an advantage, if you like. Things move quickly, people solve problems share the burden and so on. Um, so all these people here have been involved in various stages and many other people probably that I should have listed and I haven't. Um, we couldn't have done any of it without Principal Affairs and Genomes Project data, the PGP data, access to the UK 10K data, and all the people who've actually paid for these things themselves, well, we've all paid for these out of our taxes, but putting that aside, the people who've actually paid for it out of their earnings and said, here you go, here's my data. We're enormously grateful to them. Um, we couldn't have done the computing without paying a lot of money um, uh, unless we used the university uh, cluster of computers. And we couldn't have done any of the UK 10 stuff with UK 10K work without all the generous donations of people um, who are kind of part of the community and have helped with the work. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. That was absolutely fantastic. Very, very interesting to see uh, all of the work that you've done over the last couple of years in collaboration with these people. Now, um, who has questions? Questions in the audience? We have, we have a lady at the back. Well, thank you, Andy, for a fascinating talk. Can I just ask about the automated 
monotonies that you're creating. What happens when those actually go, go out into the wild and people start testing those SNPs individually? Do they hold up very well, or is that something you don't know about as yet? Well, that's kind of the phase we're at. Um, so that's what we're testing at the moment. Um, most of the SNPs seem to be reliable in that the filtering algorithms have been designed to chuck out ones that probably wouldn't work. Um, the, the major problem actually increasingly as we get further and further towards the tips of branches is having anybody who's actually going to be in that group uh, available to test. Um, so I've got a collection of samples so if I identify a new variant I can test 50 people in one afternoon for it but my collection is fairly limited in diversity whereas the online people testing commercially have to wait a lot longer it's a lot more staggered, but they're much more diverse. So it's the major problem that we're probably having is actually having enough samples to test. Not, you know, so we're more likely to fail to validate something just because we don't find anybody who's in that branch, which isn't that useful. <laughs> that leads me to the, the next question. Have you considered using the data from the UK Biobank, which has 500,000 uh, people in it, and also the people of the British Isles projects when that's made available? I've, yeah, I've tried to make contact with people in the British Isles and, and I haven't had a reply. Um, I don't know about the biobank. Um, I suspect it's um, unlikely. This Genomics England thing might be more feasible, but that's still in a kind of pilot phase. So that's 100,000 UK genomes, essentially. Any other questions? What about the next steps? I mean, what can we expect from your group in the next one to two years? Well, the UK 10K, basically. That's, that's what we're waiting for. And there'll be more publications coming in due course? There should be one from that, yeah. Okie doke. Well, any other questions for Andy? If not, then can I just ask you to show your appreciation for Mr. Andy Grayson? <laughs>